Hey yo, I'm Miss Linnea Lark. Welcome back to my tile carving series. So far I've taught you how to use my brainstorming worksheet to design your symmetrical designs and last time we learned some tricks on making your draft perfectly symmetrical. If you'd like to start at the beginning of this series, click on the card on the top right of your screen now. Today I'm going to teach you how to use our slab roller and how to transfer your design onto your wet clay. Let's go. It's time to cut out our drafts so that we can use it as a tracing template. But first, I recommend taking a picture of your draft and glazing choices. <laughs> you will need these later and it is unlikely that your draft is going to make it through the transfer process in one piece. And the nature of the carving is to cut away. So sometimes you can lose your shapes and lines when you're carving and it's nice to have a picture of what your initial design was. If you have access to a copy machine, you can even make a photocopy. So go ahead and take a photo and then carefully cut out your six by six inch square draft. Slab roller. And now it's time to make your tile. In our studio, we will be using a Brent SR20 slab roller. Isn't she lovely? Before we begin, let's check out the slab roller so we can understand its parts and how to properly use it. Essentially, the slab roller is a sturdy table with a steel roller that rolls and squishes clay flat into a perfect slab. The giant circle on the side is the handle that will roll the roller down the slab. There is a piece of canvas attached to one side. Clay doesn't stick to canvas, so the canvas allows the clay to squish and flatten without getting stuck to the steel roller. You'll always put your clay below the canvas. But it also protects the roller from getting clay stuck to it. Never let clay touch the steel roller. And if it does, make sure you wipe it off really good. And then there's the bed of the slab roller, which is the area where the clay gets flattened on. The bed is made of planks of wood that are different thicknesses called shims. We have two shims. One is thicker and has canvas attached to it. It's already ready to roll. The other is thin, brown, and does not have a canvas covering it. Beneath both shims is a piece of particle board. If you want to roll onto the dark brown shim in the particle board, beware neither of them have canvas coverings. So your clay might stick to them. But don't worry, I got you covered. Inside, somewhere, you will find a thin light pink slab mat which the clay will not stick to. So if you're rolling onto the dark brown shim or the particle board, just find the slab mat inside and place it on top of that board. Your clay can go right on top of it. When loading or unloading a shim, roll the roller all the way to the end where the canvas is attached. Pull the canvas all the way back so that the shims are completely visible. Stand at the back of the slab roller and use the circle indention to pull the shim up and toward you so that it is no longer beneath the roller on the opposite end. Carefully rotate the shim to the left side of the slab roller and stand it up on its side between the slab roller and the wedging table while you're using the slab roller. That way the shim is out of the way and nobody's going to trip on it and it's not going to break anything. This should be a smooth rotation out of the bed. You shouldn't lift it high in the air like you're jousting or throwing a javelin. We don't need you sword fighting with a giant piece of wood. You don't want to be knocking any pots off any shelves. Just slowly and carefully keep it level and get it into place. When all the shims are loaded, the thinnest slab our roller can produce is 5 16 inch thick. When only the large shim is loaded, your slab will be 3 8 inch thick. With only the thin shim loaded, your slab will be 9 16 of an inch thick. When both of the shims are out, the largest thickness our roller can produce is 3 quarters of an inch thick. All right, so now that we understand the slab roller and its parts and how it kind of works, let's go ahead and make our clay tile. Let's prep our clay. I grab a box of clay from beneath the slab roller and lug it over to the wedging table. Make sure that you bend your knees. Each box is 50 pounds. When opening the box, I do not slice through the top with a metal scraper, don't you dare. Believe me, I have made this mistake and much clay has been ruined by this mistake. If you slice this box open, you will also slice the bags of clay inside, making them dry out where nobody can use it. 
Instead, pull the taped flaps upward and just use the corner of the scraping tool to pierce the tape. It should easily pop apart afterward. Do that on both sides and then once in the middle, notice I'm still holding the flaps up high so that I do not accidentally cut the clay bags. It's so easy. Instead of trying to lift the 25 pound bricks out of the box, I go ahead and push down each side of the box, ripping the walls so that it's flat. You'll need to flatten the box anyway. I slide each clay bag out of the box and fold it up nice and flat and then walk it out the front door to the ramp where you can tuck it in between the ramp railing and the classroom wall. Please don't be a lazy baby. It just leave an empty box on the ground. Instead, take pride in being a good student and a good human that keeps the studio clean. Please, I beg of you, pick up after yourselves. I then unwind the wire, taking it off the bag forever. Do not keep these. But instead of leaving it out on our communal wedging table or throwing it onto the ground like a barbarian, I put it in my pocket until I come across a trash can. When I'm done with this bag, I'll roll up the top and then use a clip to keep the air out. I unbag way more clay than I need so that the bag isn't in my way when it's time to cut. But how much clay do I need? Let's figure this out. Notice that the shape of our 6x6 tile is different than the shape of the clay brick. The tile is square and the brick of clay is rectangular from the top view. So we need to figure out how much clay to cut off to give us a slab that is large enough to fit our tile. There are a few important things to understand and have in mind before figuring out how much clay to cut. First, no slab is a perfect shape. Yes, slabs come out a consistent thickness, but notice how the shape and edges are not perfectly straight. They're rather cracked and some areas might be wider or thinner than others. Because of this, the outer edges of the slab are rarely usable, especially when we're looking to have straight edges and corners. This means you're going to need more clay than is required to make your tile shape. It doesn't come out a perfect tile shape. Secondly, when you squish a lump of clay in the slab roller, it doesn't get too much wider. It mostly gets longer in the direction that the roller is rolling. It makes sense, right? Do you see how the roller is squishing the clay longer and longer? Notice how big the clay was at the start and notice how much longer it is after it's been squished. Thirdly, notice that these two pieces of clay that are the same size when loaded into the wheel in different directions are both elongated in the same direction. But because they were loaded in opposite directions, they are wildly different in shape. It is crucial that you load your clay with the width that you want to have parallel to the roller. A good way to check if you have loaded your clay correctly is to draw an arrow on the top of your clay pointing in the direction that you want your clay to extend. So notice when I put my draft on top of my clay, it needs to get longer this direction. So that's where I draw my arrow. Then when you take your clay over to the slab roller, face the arrow in the direction that the slab roller will be moving. The last thing to understand is that the clay we put in the roller needs to be thicker than our desired outcome. If you put a piece of clay through the roller that is thinner than the gap between the bed and the roller, it won't even squish. It will just glide right on through. This means that we want our clay to be thicker than our goal thickness when we load it into the slab roller. Why is this all important? Well, because we're trying to estimate how much clay we need to cut off of the brick, remember? <sighs> When I place my draft up to the brick of clay, I notice that it is plenty wide enough. Excellent. But I also notice that my draft is larger than the rectangular shape of the brick. This means I'm going to need to rely on my slab roller squishing the clay and making it longer, which we already know it will do. But that means that I'm going to need a rather thick bit of clay so that there will be enough clay to squish to make that length. So our tiles are going to be about three quarters of an inch thick and that is about as big as one of my fingers. And since I need to almost double in length, I'm going to double it and make it two fingers. But also I know that the slab doesn't stretch perfectly and the outside is usually unusable. So to be on the safe side, I'm going to add a third finger. So I'm going to cut three fingers worth of clay off of this brick. 
Yes, that's a lot of clay. And yes, I'm going to have too much. But it's better to have too much than to have to re-wedge and remake a slab all over again. Especially when there's a line of 30 kids trying to use that slab roller. And then I use my wire cutter to cut the clay off smoothly and cleanly and levelly. Remember to keep your wire cutter flat and move it parallel with the tabletop for the flattest cut possible. If you don't cut with a parallel movement, you'll probably end up with a diagonal cut where one side is thicker than the other. Or if you're just a crazy loosey goosey kid, you might end up with some crazy whacked out cut. Don't worry, if you mess it up, it's just dirt, we can fix it. Just recut and start again. Any unused clay can be re-wedged and used or if it's a small amount, it can be balled up, sprayed, and saved for later. I mark my clay with arrows the direction I need it to get longer, and then head over to the slab roller. It's time to squish this dirt. Slab roller. Before using the slab roller, make sure that the bed and canvas and wheel are all free of any old clay and general debris from the classroom. Please do not leave or even sit things on the slab roller like it's your stinking dining room table. Keep it clear for the rest of us. Before I load my clay, I want to make sure that I have the right thickness. We will be taking both shims out and making a 3 4 inch tile. So I move the wheel all the way down to the end with the canvas attached. I flip back the canvas, I pull out the top two shims, and I make sure that I have a slab mat down. That's this pink tablecloth almost, and that's going to keep our clay from sticking to the wooden plank. I make sure that that slab mat is tucked nicely underneath the wheel and then I'm ready to load my clay. When loading your clay, the wheel should be at the same end where the canvas is attached. But make sure that you move the roller a wee bit down the bed so that it has some extra room for the clay to stretch on the way back. I flip my canvas, double check my slab mat, and load my clay. Remember to point the arrows in the direction that you want your clay to elongate. I put one hand's width between my clay and my roller so that it has extra room to stretch. And then I slap down the side closest to the roller so that it has a nice ramp and can easily grip the clay. Always keep your hands away from the roller. This roller is crazy powerful and will crush your little bitty fingers. Seriously, I know there are medical marvels nowadays, but how are you going to rebuild your fingers if your phalanges have all been crushed into powder? Get your hands out of there. And then, hand over hand, without stopping, roll the roller over your clay. You will feel some resistance when you hit the clay. This is normal. Keep going and don't stop in the middle. You never want to stop rolling once you've started as it can leave dents in your slab if the roller rests in one place for too long. You want to keep it moving. When you feel the resistance stop, that means that you flattened all your clay and it is safe to stop and then make the return journey back. So roll your handle in the opposite direction to your starting place. I flip open my canvas and ta-da! You've got a slab! Notice how the slab shape altered. The clay got flatter and longer and larger. This is what happens when you squish clay. And look, three fingers was the perfect amount. When you finish using your slab roller, place all the shims back inside and then close the canvas. All right, now it's time to transfer our design onto the clay. I take my slab, my draft, and a scraping tool back to my desk. Notice how my slab is even. However, there is a bumpy texture on the clay that was pressed into it from the canvas of the slab roller. So I use my scraper to smooth out both sides of my slabs. I like to scrape it in at least two different directions. If you don't have a scraper, you can also use a rib to smooth out your clay. Now we need to transfer our image onto the clay tile. Before we start, you want to find a hard, thin, and round tip tool. Make sure that your tool doesn't have a super sharp tip because that will cut, rip, or nick the paper draft. But also make sure that it's not super wide or else your lines will be way too thick and you won't easily be able to draw fine details. I kind of want a dull pointy tip that won't break the paper when it starts to dampen from the clay. In the video you can see me use this rainbow tool. I love this tool, but we don't have that many. You can also use one of the small ball tools, 
Most of them are two-sided. I would use the smaller of the two sides. You might even be able to find a wooden and metal tool that won't rip your paper. And this is the perfect time to let you know that I am now an Amazon affiliate. That means that you can find these tools and other tools that I use on my Amazon store. The link is in the description below this video. If you like my videos and want to help support me make these videos, you can buy tools from my store and I get a small amount of money from Amazon. Hip hip hooray! And you know what that means. I'll be able to afford to use my wall air conditioner unit this summer. Woohoo! <laughs> thank you for the support and for helping me stay cool. For reals, thank you. Once you have a smooth slab on both sides and a tracing tool picked out, you'll place your draft onto your clay and gently rub it so that it doesn't move. Once your paper comes into contact with the clay, you don't want to linger too long. You want to kind of move quickly. The wetter the paper gets, the more likely it is to rip. So keep moving, but don't be sloppy either. With my draft in place, I carefully use an X-Acto blade or knife to cut out the shape of my 6x6 inch square tile. Ball up any excess clay and immediately place it in your overflow Ziploc baggie. I like to give a few squirts of water now and every few days just to keep that clay wet. All of my students should have their own overflow Ziploc baggies on their shelves and they should be keeping them wet as well. It is your job to keep your clay wet and workable. If you have a large amount of clay, wedge it together on the wedging table, spray it really good, and then put it back in the fresh clay bag where anyone can use it. I forgot to videotape this at the time, but before you ball up all your extra slab scraps and re-wedge them, save a large scrap piece to practice your carving skills for the next class. The scrap piece should be about the size of your hand, give or take. Next class, you will practice on scrap clay before carving straight into your tile. You will keep this practice lab all throughout this project so that it is always ready and available to practice on. You can even carve on the front and the back. So make sure you spray and bag it well and keep it safe. It's time to trace our draft onto our clay tile. You will notice that the moisture in the clay will help keep your paper in place. But just be aware that the moistening paper will be easy to rip and your draft may not make it through this process. It's not a big deal, but just make sure that you're moving quickly and gently. Once you have a round tip tool ready, you will gently press along all the major lines of your draft. I gently trace all the major lines and shapes and ignore any of the small texture lines. Those can be added back in later when we start carving. Pay close attention to the lines. Try not to miss any. When you think that you're finished, it's a good idea to look closely one more time and maybe feel it with your hands gently to make sure that you haven't missed any major lines. And then you're going to peel up your draft. Notice that when I peel up my draft, it starts to rip. That's because I use thin graph paper. I recorded this section before I made your draft worksheets. You're welcome because that worksheet paper usually holds up through this process. So you should be able to release yours a little bit easier than I did mine. If your paper does rip or leaves paper behind like mine did, gently get the large pieces, but just ignore all the small fibers. If your draft doesn't rip, then hold on to it. Put it in your ceramics folder because it can be useful when you start to carve. Take a second to observe the dents or impressions that your tool left behind where you trace the lines. The lines are hard to see, but they should be there. Go ahead and use a needle tool to trace those lines again. Try not to go very deep at all. Just be gentle, lightly tracing with the needle tool. If you go too deep, your tile may crack on that line as it starts to dry. So only press as hard as is necessary to clearly see your lines. And now you have a clay tile with your symmetrical design on it. That's as far as we can go today as the clay is too wet to start carving. It's got to set up a little bit. Let's talk about how to store your tile till our next class. We want our clay to get a little bit harder, but we don't want it to get super hard. Once the core of our tile gets dry, it's hard to carve. You can re-wet it a little here, a little there, but it always wants to be drying. And when your clay dries, it tends to chip and flake on the edges and it's very difficult to carve details. 
So we want our clay to set up a little bit, but not too much. There are lots of variables on how quickly your clay is going to dry. One of those being how tightly you bag it, making sure that there's as little air inside as possible. Another is whether or not you allow your clay to touch the board. The board is going to soak up excess water from your clay. So it's actually going to help us dry out your tiles. So if you're going to have this class in the next day or two, I would go ahead and slide your tile on your board right into the bag as one piece and get out any excess air as possible. If you're concerned that you're going to miss a class or you know it's gonna be some time before you can work on your tile, use a bag or in my case, a hairnet to cover your board. This will protect your tile from the board wanting to soak up all its moisture. You can even spray the tile and the bag to make it last longer. Just be very careful while you're handling it. The more you handle your clay while it's wet like this, the more likely it is to crack later on. When the clay bends while it's wet, it makes all these little rips and tears deep inside of the clay. And when it starts to dry out and shrink, it tends to crack easily in these places. So especially while the clay is wet, be extra careful that you are handling it with care. Make sure that your tile is flat because however it dries, it will be that way forever. And it's always a good idea to double bag your clay as it might have holes in it. You don't want to bend it, nick it, or accidentally squish it while you're bagging it. Look, I just did that. Next time, we're gonna learn about carving tools and how to carve out shapes on multiple planes. If you're enjoying this video series on carving a clay tile, please like and subscribe and ring that bell to get notified when I release my next video. If you'd like to send me even more support, check out my Amazon shop's link in the description below. If you have any questions or comments, please write those in the comment section and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Thank you for watching and happy day.